Good afternoon. Here's some Good Friday reflections for us. This decade so far, the last three years at least, been a crazy time of chaos, hasn't it? We've had a worldwide pandemic that is still not fully over. Racial tensions flaring more than since the civil rights era, perhaps. A continuous stream of political upheaval. We saw the first major split of our denomination in 140 years. Political divisiveness worse than maybe since the Civil War. And there's this barrage of news regarding religion as well. The news of the Catholic Church covering up a century of abuse by leaders in Baltimore. Moral failings of other pastors being brought up in the news cycle over and over again. And there's a battle between Israel and Palestine, one of the most holy sites in both the Jewish and Muslim faiths. I was going to bring up how Ramadan, Passover, and Easter all fall within the same time this year on Sunday, and how I prayed this would be pleasing to God. Then the day after I wrote that in my sermon I'm creating, I saw the news of this battle on Holy Land at the Temple Mount at the Aqsa Mosque. And while people are there worshiping God, military battles ensue. Sad, sad news. And of course, now the violence and tensions are escalating. We had a COB member visit us once in St. Pete who lived in Israel with his son. And he wanted us to be aware of how horrible the Palestinians were treated by the Israelites in their own land. I know we hear over and over again by some Christians, we have to stand with Israel. There are some that feel we have to be loyal to the first chosen people by God, I suppose. Yet I would say, isn't the Old Testament filled with instances when God was not happy with, with Israel? When the Jews were chastised, punished even by God, as they didn't do God's will, were not hospitable, not merciful, worshiping idols, etc. Who's to say they are not again displeasing God with their behavior of this group of people, rather than showing love, learning to get along, sharing the land, welcoming the foreigner. And not just the foreigners, those that were there all along. I don't know how fully, if one side is more correct than the other, but I do know violence is not the answer. And so I pray that peace may prevail and God finds a way to have the Holy Land not to be filled with hostility someday. And we have mass shootings galore and natural disaster occurring over and over again. I surely must say it seems like Jesus will return soon. But I don't worry about this really. Scripture tells us we will not know the day and the time. We are just to be ready and walk each step, live each moment, connected to Jesus and abiding in him. Which we discussed a little last night at our love feast. And we know there has always been turmoil in the world, calamities, social upheaval, they're not new in history, and no doubt will continue while this broken world is allowed to go on as it is. The days were dark and people were weary during the time of Christ's death as well. Emperors of Rome were at times cruel to the Jews. There was a lot of controversy occur occurring due to the teachings and ministry of Jesus. There were wars and power struggles, poverty, and people living in sin. I'm not sure if moral degradation has gotten worse in our society or we're just more aware of it now, but it sure seems like we need Jesus more than ever. Now let's discuss Good Friday, the day on which Christ was crucified that we commemorate today. Just a few hours ago, he breathed his last breath and said it is finished. I just wish God's kingdom was more fully seen since this utterance, don't you? We won't be getting into the passion narrative as we looked at this last Saturday, 
So if you want to really look at the crucifixion and prophecies surrounding Holy Week, I hope you will watch our Palm Sunday worship service. We ended Palm Sunday with verse 54 of Matthew 27. When Jesus died and the veil of the temple was torn and the earth shook, and the centurion and those with him proclaimed their faith. Now we will look at the final verses of this chapter. Verse 55 says, Many women were also there looking on in a distance. They were there with Jesus, it says, ministering to him, traveling alongside the apostles all the way from Galilee. We sometimes forget how many women were a part of the biblical story, and though there's not that much writing about it. This is, of course, due to patriarchy, but they were there, it says. And a name, son. But there were more since it says among them. And we know Jesus spoke to his mother Mary and told John to take care of her while he was on the cross. We know women also played a part in the burial of Jesus and somewhere at the empty tomb. But the main character here regarding the preparation of Jesus' body, listed in all the Gospels, is Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. And it says he too was a disciple of Jesus. Verse 58 said he asked Pilate for Jesus' body, and he agreed. Then it says he wrapped the body in a clean linen cloth and laid it in a new tomb in the rock. So it was like a cave. This was to be his tomb. He wanted Jesus to have a proper burial. And spices were used in the garment to keep the body from premature decay. Then it says he rolled a great stone to the door and went away. And it again mentions women were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Remember in chapter 26 of Matthew, we read this part yesterday evening, that the day prior to the Last Supper, a woman anointed Jesus with an expensive oil, and Judas chastised this act, saying it was a waste of money. But Jesus said she had prepared him for burial. Another woman being involved in important things. And the last section is about how the chief priests and Pharisees asked Pilate to make sure the tomb was secure due to Jesus' words that after three days he would rise. They wanted to be sure the disciples would not go steal the body and it says he and then say he had been raised. So Pilate granted the request and ordered a guard of soldiers to secure the tomb and it says they sealed the stone. I don't know if this can be proven, but I looked up how a huge rock would have been sealed at this time, and some suggested that Roman wax was used to round it. And some say a cord would be placed across it and fastened at each end with an official Roman seal made with clay, so that someone would be able to tell if the stone was moved. And so Jesus is no doubt washed up, the blood is no longer in his body. It's prepared with spices, and he's wrapped in a seamless linen cloth, all typical ways to be buried. And he's not put in the ground like some would be. He's given an expensive tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. And then it again says how the priests and religious rulers are used by God to prove that Jesus was indeed in this tomb, no way to be taken out, sealed and guarded so they could prove, no doubt on the third day, that Jesus was a liar. And this uproar of a so-called Messiah would finally be put to rest. The status quo would be maintained and they would be left with the power they had been losing since Jesus started his ministry. This Thursday, while I visited Leon, Susan, and their family at the hospital, he passed away peacefully. This was only the second time I was there when someone had passed. It's a precious time in any case, being with the family in this raw time of grief. I never really know if I'm saying the right things, when to leave, when to pray, but it's beautiful albeit a bit awkward to be there at such an intimate time. I was asked to anoint his body again. 
as I anointed him in a dual sense just two days prior, either for healing or for passing. One of the first things as I touched his forehead with a niece's holy water she pulled out of her purse was from dust you were formed and to dust you shall return. This is from Genesis 319, something God said to Adam after he and Eve had been brought death to all of humanity. Jesus would not return to dust as we know. It's part of the tradition in many churches to put ashes on our foreheads on Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent, a reminder of this, to grasp our frail human bodies, not meant to live wholly without the many ways they deteriorate and cause us pain. We are mortal. These bodies will not last. Now, Leon was 97. He went peacefully and his family was not too distraught, but it's still hard. We all have to deal with death. Unfortunately, it's a part of life. I remember Stephanie just bawling when she came to the realization that someday Smitty and I would pass on. She just kept saying, you can't die. And we said, honey, everyone dies. And this did happen to have, have to happen to Jesus too, but not in a natural way, not in a way he deserved, but in this cruel, degrading way. He had to be prepared in this way. The tomb had to be secured in this way. It's part of the miracle that will occur when the story continues in a couple of days and the tomb was empty, when he will arise not just be brought up to the Father, but walk amongst his people, talk and eat with them, proving his body cannot be succumbed by death. And then he will again be gone, ascending to the right hand of the Father forevermore. So this Good Friday, only called good because of what we know is to come, of course, may we realize how fearfully and wonderfully we are made how Jesus provided a way for his story to go on, bring more people to faith in him, that they too would cry out Hosanna, meaning Lord, save us. And they would get a glimpse of his love for them and be forever changed. Amidst the turmoil of the news cycle, the fear we continually have to give to the Lord be thankful for the cross and for the faith we have been given and try to relish every moment given to us in this short time we are given in this life to live and to love and to make a difference, to bear fruit when we abide in our Lord, our Savior, Jesus. Hope to see you Sunday.